Patapon 3 is a sequel I have a hard time loving, but also disliking. My opinions are mixed, but before I give them I'd like to start all the way back for the sake of context, to explain where my opinions come from. I guess we should start talking about the first game, but I'd rather begin even before that. Let's talk about the titular characters. The Patapons were created by French artist Rolito and already existed back in 2000, over half a decade before the first game came out. By 2002, they were already featuring in his website, Rolitoland, a webpage that was like a visit to an odd alien world full of wonders shown through small drawings and animations. Sadly, this webpage doesn't exist anymore. It was updated in 2012 according to the blog of the same name. I never saw the updated version because nowadays it doesn't seem to exist. Every time I go to the webpage it either shows this or gives an error message of some kind. I've tried on multiple web browsers and they all gave me the same results, so I can't show any footage of all the charming animations that you could see in there, and they might have been lost forever. There was this one with round guys going on a fight with square guys with white eyes like them, clashing blades only to get killed by a man with some sort of shotgun or blunderbuss during the middle of the fight. Maybe they would have stayed as just another small piece of the artist's repertoire, but one day during a visit at the Interlink planning offices, Hiroyuki Kotani was shown a picture featuring these tiny eyeballs with spears. He was captivated and quickly got inspired to make a strategy game about them featuring drums. After the usual development hijinks and a back and forth between Rolito and the team to design the different creatures, a real-time strategy and rhythm hybrid was born, the Tale of Patapon. And now we move on to the first game, but first a question, where do you enter in the story? You are technically a character in the game, you play the role of the almighty Patapon, the god of the tribe that will lead them to fulfill their prophecy, commanding their forces during battle, but you can only communicate your orders to them through music. You bang the drums to the beat like you'd expect of a rhythm game, but rather than pressing buttons on Q, they appear on screen, you take the lead as you do four note commands. Then the game repeats your notes and you get to do another command, it's like Space Channel 5 in reverse. As long as you play to the beat, you can do any of the available commands, it's all up to your judgement, you'll have to analyze the situation on the go and react accordingly. The gameplay, the music and the characters all feed each other so to speak. The music saves the gameplay, but so does the gameplay save the music being always at 120 BPM and following a 4x4 pattern so you always keep the same beat throughout all the missions. Which makes it all the more amazing since the soundtrack feels so varied in all three games. Sound effects add to this. Each drum makes very distinct sounds depending on how well you keep to the beat. If you're off they sound bad, but when you hit it at the perfect time, the drum sounds just right. Visually, it's also a treat, I've already said how charming Rolito's drawings are, but take a look at the screen while you play, the sounds pop into the screen as you make them, and there is always a border that represents the beat, when you play good enough they change color like a rainbow. And then there's the combo counter worm which gets more agitated as you play, and when you get good enough it goes crazy. The patapons themselves add to this. They're the ones who repeat your melodies as they follow your commands, like a group of recruits singing cadence during a march. At first, they sing calmly, but once you get a good rhythm going or enough commands right, they'll get more excited until they're radiating with energy. In this state, the patapons become more powerful, and they feel stronger as the background music becomes more lively and the patapons shout, making up their own lyrics in response to your tune. This attitude mixes with their cute design, their dialogue and their little animations, they jump in celebration after a victory, they trip and stomp their feet when you lose the beat, they move their body to the beat of the drum, all this helps bring them to life, making them endearing in a way reminiscent of children. That's the way I see it, they give off an innocent child like Cora, with their small and squeezy look and their voices provided mostly by an actual kid, Kotani is the 10 year old son. Hiroyuki Kotani, in an interview, said, I heard somewhere that Patapon means child in French, and a lot of fans thought that Patapons were children, even I think of them as my kids, and Rolito calls me the Patapons' other father. I find no confirmation of this, but there is the song Il était in Berger, which uses the word to refer to a young separate girl. 
Either way, it just gives me more reason to see them as childlike. To add to this, the game has you swear an oath to help the Patapons prevail on their quest, with one of the lines stating, The Patapons shall be your sons. You're like a father figure to them, and they count on you to help them rise back to glory. The presentation is beautiful, and the quest is epic but the actual gameplay is overall a very casual experience with maybe a few difficulty spikes, although some bosses can punish you by permanently killing your units, which gets more annoying the more you've invested into them. Grinding to get materials for top tier units just to lose them forever is a pain in the butt. It's a simple game, but not lacking in content, as you advance through the game you unlock more type of units, and you can create a special races of Patapon with their own special stats. You get repeatable hunting missions and bosses to farm resources, you gain new weapons and commands to make you and your army stronger, and there is a plethora of minigames you can unlock. Some of these minigames give you resources, while others allow you to obtain buffs and very special equipment. This way players who can beat a mission have a way to make it easier, and also it's good if you just want to see your army grow stronger and stronger. This isn't a good game for completionists though. You can't replay regular story missions, which must make getting all items a frustrating experience since some of the drops are random and some exclusive to these story missions. In fact, I'm very sure it's literally impossible, since a non-repeatable boss has two unique drops and he can only give one. And much like the gameplay, the story is simple but with some twists and turns of their own that are interesting. The Patapons are a tribe that was once legendary, but now they're on the brink of extinction, cornered by an enemy tribe called the Zygoton, based surely on the square guys I mentioned before, only with their eyes red to make them more distinct and evil looking. Everything seems lost until you, their god, come to take charge of things and help them strike back against the Zygotons and fulfill their all prophecy. At the end of the earth, something glorious awaits, something known only as IT. Nobody knows what it is, but the legends tell it will bring great joy if you see it, so of course they want to go there. Nothing complicated at first sight, the round eyes are good, the red eyed squares are bad and you have to kill them so your little man can advance and reach the end of the earth. But then you meet Gong, an enemy general determined to stop the Patapon. He's an antagonist but he shows an admirable loyalty to his queen, and even some form of noble spirit. To learn from him the Zygotons follow their own prophecy that tells them a great disaster will happen to the Earth if your tribe marches towards the end. You also get to see one of the Zygotons express pain at losing an ally at the hand of your units. And that's not all even in the first game. The game is cute and cheerful like a fairy tale, but just like one it doesn't shy away from the uglier side of things. You won't see the characters get skewered or bleed or have their organs come out, if they even have any. But it is a war, and the game feels like one despite remaining fun for all ages. Patapon is a small but fulfilling journey both for the titular eyeballs and for the player, with an exciting finale that is followed by a tease of something more. Something that looks like a promise of more adventure. And although Hiroyuki Kotani claims they hadn't planned to make a sequel at the time, there was a sequel after all. Patapon 2 follows the beat of the first game and adds on top of it. It can be described as Patapon 1, but bigger. There are more commands, more unit types, more Patapon species, more weapons, more mini games now with 3 difficulties, more bosses, and other things while keeping to the same gameplay. Some of the more annoying aspects have been changed. Patapons cannot die permanently anymore, and you can make your Patapons change between the regular race and all the different Rarapons, which are now unlocked through an upgrade tree. Also, you can now level up these races to make them stronger, although there is a lot of grinding for money and resources to do so, since every individual Patapon has its own tree. Speaking of resources, there are more ways to get them thanks to the new minigames. And also, you can replay a few of the normal battle missions in this game, which gives an easy way to farm gear. And that's good, because you'll need that. Patapon 2 is harder. I've seen more people get stuck at parts of this game than the first one, though it is true this time, there is an easy mode for players that want a less complicated experience. I've tried it once and I can say it is indeed easy. Easier than the first game, in fact. But the biggest change is the hero, a special unit that takes a dedicated force spot in your formation and can be any class and race you've unlocked. Unless he gets killed by certain moves, he never stays down in battle. He can respawn after some time that gets longer with every death. 
and has a special skill that activates when you play perfectly to the beat while in fever mode, which is signaled by a unique sound when hitting the last note perfectly and some backup singing that if played a lot in a row gets a bit repetitive. He has a unique skill for each class and they're all useful, but they override any other command which can be really annoying when your hero refuses to run away from a boss and gets eaten while doing his special attack. Last but not least, he can equip different masks that alter his stats, but these are only obtained through multiplayer. Pretty early in the game you unlock Paragat, from which you can access multiplayer. It plays similar to single player, but it's far from the same. Each of the four players gets to control only a hero pad upon instead of a full square. They all act independently following the rhythm and command, but they have to work together to take down a boss or go through a level. The content is all repeated from the single player, with some being taken from the first game, but it's still fun as an optional thing. It's Batapon's fun gameplay after all, and it's apparently accessible even if none of your friends has the game thanks to a sure game option. The only thing that changes is they'll have to use one of these preset heroes that exist instead of their own, and if you have no friends to play with, you can use these preset heroes as CPU controlled teammates, each with their own personality. Playing gets you more CPU heroes, but also more masks, and it can serve you as another way to form materials, gear, and kachin, that is to say money. That said, I don't like that they all have a time limit. They're not usually that tight and I imagine it's for the sake of balance, but I don't think time limits go hand in hand well with a game like Patapon. Gameplay aside, the story is more of the same. You still have an epic quest in which your army travels the lands and battles an army and takes out some big creatures. This time the enemy are a masked tribe called the Kamen. Their soldiers and architecture have a really neat design with some cool African tribal mask inspiration. Although my biggest complaint would be at times it feels like too much of the same. I get giving a nod or two to the previous game, but there are a few levels that are way too similar to the first one, almost exact same. Those Patapon 1 rehashes aside, the things that are different are memorable and fun and just make me wish you could actually replay every stage the exact same as the first time, just with stronger enemies as needed. All in all, Patapon 2 is even better than the first one. It takes the original and expands on it for what's in my opinion the best game in the franchise. If you liked Patapon 1, chances are you'll like Patapon 2. Finally comes the third game. This one takes Patapon in a different direction, and you could already tell from the trailers. The footage hinted at a darker story, with a metal score for the soundtrack, and a more humanoid character wearing a mask much more complex than any worn by the hero in Patapon 2. This was going to be unlike anything that came before. And it doesn't stop at the trailers. As soon as you run the game, you get some good looking 3D animations, and then this. This title screen sets the mood perfectly, with the dark stormy clouds, the chanting and the percussion that sounds like an army marching, building up to the guitars the same way the songs during missions in Patapon get progressively more energetic. I love this title screen, visually it's not much compared to the second game, but it hides me every time I hear it. I'd say this is the best title screen of the series, hands down. This darker mood set by the title screen on the cinematics before and after continues in the first stage, which actually plays a lot like the first level of all Patapon games. You just learn to move and go forward without anything else happening. And there's the same structure of one character waking up and then meeting with a few more that will serve as your starting squad. It's the same, but with a new coat of paint and a hero to help make it feel fresh. Also, now for some reason, the Patapons sing alongside the drums and not just after them. But once you finish this introduction, everything is, indeed, unlike anything that came before it. The gameplay itself is almost identical at its core, but there are some quality of life changes. You start with all commands from the second game, so you can do all movements from the second mission on. There's also two new songs you can obtain. One of them, a pause song that makes the Patapon defend when you unpause. Much better than putting a PSP on standby. 
perfect beats to still activate a special attack from your hero. But now it's only as long as you repeat a particular command that changes with the hero's class. In exchange, now it happens almost instantly and can be cancelled quickly by evasive songs so your hero won't refuse to back away when he needs to. Getting a song perfectly seems much easier in this game. I find it too easy now, but you get to use hero mode a lot, which comes in very handy in this game. Miracles, or sutras this time, have been changed too. I didn't mention miracles before, but to those who don't know, in Patapon 1 and 2, miracles has stopped everything around your units to make you do a minigame that would activate a special effect. Here, instead, your Patapons keep advancing while you do the minigame and the effect takes place during the sequence instead of after. Also, they need to be charged to use them, and they usually have one use per mission. But there's also bigger changes, most notably the team composition. As you may have realized from the footage shown so far, rather than growing an army, you stay with the same team from start to end. This takes away the feeling of the first two games. There's no army here, you don't get to add more units and make a team that gets bigger, it doesn't feel anymore like a war. So your team has four characters excluding Hanapon, who I will talk about later. They're all very standard fare. One bow, one spear, one sword, and your hero who starts with one of those three weapons based on your choice. However, they make up in numbers with outrageous gear options that get crazier as you progress and an experience system. Your Patapons will level up as you play missions, unlocking new classes they can change into, set skills that can be equipped regardless of the class, and four class-specific ones with their own experience system. When you put it all together, there is a good amount of customization. Add to it all the equipment you can get and you have potential for all sorts of builds. A build based on fire damage, a build based on critical hits, build based on sleeping or poisoning or staggering, and so on. It seems like everything has a place. All the different status effects and elements feel more useful than ever. They're not only good against you, but for you too. But that also means they're more common than ever in Patapon. Elements and status effects become serious business. A special mention goes to fire. Fire is everywhere. Regular soldiers like fire weapons, fire monsters appear pretty soon and are present until the end of the game, and chances are one of your Patapons at least will have a chance to burn things. To make it worse, grass is everywhere, and it catches fire easily, and anyone that touches burning grass burns just as easily. Even the enemies will set themselves on fire, due to how resistances are calculated, even if you have 100% burn resistance you can still burst into flames. Burning makes your characters run without control all over the screen and into danger, and it will easily become the number one thing that interrupts your attacks. I recommend investing in nice gear. You won't stop burning, but it still reduces the chance somewhat, and makes your Patapons take less damage from fire. When it comes to the different classes, they're all interesting, especially when used by your hero who has a unique mask and a special attack for each one. In theory, if you're stuck at one point in the game, you can just switch the classes of the characters and try a different strategy. But it's not so easy. While the classes you unlock at start at higher levels and the basic ones, they don't gain any experience unless you are using them. It makes sense, but there is a good amount of them and keeping them all at the same level is too much of a pain to be fun. For example, you unlock this class called the Strobo when you reach level 5 with the Terasai, the basic sword and seal class. You keep using the Terasai and some other things that are in the Strobo while you advance through the story. Eventually, you are doing level 18 missions and for whatever reason you want to mix things up and use the Strobo. Since you unlock him at level 5, that's where he starts, and that's the level he has since he hasn't gained any experience. You may think you can just carry him through a high level mission and get him up to date fast, but as it turns out, there is a leveling cap. You can only go up one level per mission with its character, so you're going to have to do at least 13 missions, just so he can be on par with your team. And there's the class skills I mentioned before. Each class has its own skills, and they level up by doing different actions like repeating the defense command, throwing charged spears, or healing allies. Once you get max experience on a skill, you unlock the next one and maybe, just maybe, the max out one gets inherited by some other classes too. Thankfully, these ones feel less needed to have a strong character for the most part, 
because the requirements are even more of a grind and it doesn't even track your progress in a good way. You want to level up the skill that gives you freeze immunity? Just go to one of the few levels that have snow and waste over an hour in the same spot doing commands. And then there's farming and upgrading gear added to the mix. Whatever equipment you get out of a mission is mostly random. Only thing guaranteed are the quality of a very specific drop and the maximum level you can get in each mission. What equipment will you actually get, what attribute they'll have and what level they'll start at is up to random chance. You do get a shop to buy equipment, which changes randomly after every mission, and a force to upgrade it. They help a lot to ease things, but even then it takes a lot of time. Weapons and armor take a ching and materials to upgrade, and as they level up, the prices get higher and higher. The stronger weapons by level 10 get outrageous, even if you can sell things to gain more ching, you'll have to work hard for those stat boosts. Patapon has always had random drops and grinding, but Patapon 3 takes it too far. The only thing that comes somewhat close is Paragate in Patapon 2, and that wasn't as necessary. While I had trouble, I managed to beat Patapon 2 my first time without getting masked or going out of my way to level all my units. With Patapon 3, I had no such luck. In its defense, at least the grinding amounts to something, since the numbers get a lot bigger as you go. You really feel like you become stronger. Before you reach the final boss, you might be doing over 10,000 points of damage per hit, which for Patapon is insane. However, this brings us to Hatapon. Hatapon is the little guy who carries your team's flag. He's been there since the first game and he always had his own life bar, and if he died, it would be an automatic game over for you. But I didn't mention him there because he can take enough damage that aside from rare circumstances like when he gets hit by a boss's instant death move, you won't see him die before the rest of the team. But in Patapon 3, since the numbers get way bigger as you advance the story and he stays the same throughout the whole thing, he quickly becomes frail like a napkin. The guy doesn't seem to reach 350 points of life, even the most basic enemies will kill him in one hit. The silver lining to this is that as long as there is a Taterasai or any of these related classes alive, Hatapon is immortal, but as soon as that guy dies, Hatapon is most likely getting pulverized by any bad guy that so much as looks at him funny. This is one of the most annoying aspects of the gameplay. Before, losing your frontliners would be a huge loss, but most of the time you could still make a comeback if you kept your cool with some skill and patience. But here, it was very rare not to get a game over right after. Both in my original playthrough and the replay I did for the sake of the review, I ended up getting sick of it all and giving this man a giant shield to make sure he would not die, even if it meant sacrificing all his offensive power. Bottom line, Hatapon is so weak, it isn't funny. The only good reason I can think of to make him like this is as a balance for multiplayer, where you'd have four players controlling a hero who can respawn over and over again. To be honest, the whole game gives me that sensation, as if the entire thing was made with multiplayer at the front in mind. The opening oath even mentions you soul call upon allies from parallel worlds. Not only is the team composed of 4 men like in Patapon 2 multiplayer, but the leveling system also seems made with online in mind. The hero is the only one who can learn all skills from all classes, since there are a few skills that can't be learned by the other 3 guys even if they can use the class. The levels, too, are impossible to max out without playing the multiplayer-only stages or using an exploit with a particular class and burning grass. And speaking of grass, Bow Monk is made for versus battles. He can be used anywhere but his class skills are meant for arena battles. I'll explain those battles right after this. The gear only coming from inside crates I assume only happens so the different players may get different equipment from the same mission. The replacement of miracles with sutras might be balancing things, but it also feels like it was done because it couldn't have players stop the others in their tracks or drag behind over and over to activate the miracles. Of these sutras, you can only get two of them in single player, and one of them you can miss the first time. If you miss, you'll have to buy it in a shop only available if you play online. The same shop where all the cosmetics for your hero and base are. This is a big departure from the second game, where you could get everything offline. Difficulty is also higher, 
which from my point of view would make sense to do if you're going to have 4 jack tap dudes with superpowers following their own individual rhythm. There's also the other new song that I didn't explain before. It allows you to walk backwards, but it can only be obtained in a multiplayer only stage and can only be used in multiplayer games. And that last one doesn't even make sense. It would be pretty useful to be able to have this command, especially in the arena team battles. Yes, throughout the story you'll play several duels against one of the bad guys, which will take the form of a team battle. These battles are the game modes you have available when playing versus battles against other players. There's three of them. One which is based on controlling towers, and the winner is the team that resists the opposite's flag or has the most points at the end of the round. Another is an obstacle race that contains some obstacles which only affect one participant and others that affect everyone. And finally, there's the rocket one, where you hit a lever to fire rockets at the enemy. Or if you have range attacks, you just shoot at the enemy directly. They all have some good ideas, but neither of them is that interesting against the CPU. But the one with the rockets takes the cake. It's the only one I couldn't imagine myself enjoying, even with other players. I understand there may be some complexity to it that doesn't shine unless you're fighting other players, but all the times I've been forced to play it to advance the story, it was a bore. Regarding the other missions, the hunting ones are gone as are all the minigames, making gathering certain resources feel more complicated. Bosses don't drop materials anymore either. Speaking of bosses, fighting them is not as fulfilling as before. Now they're usually at the end of a dungeon, a stage consisting of multiple levels that must be played in a row. These are a fun concept by themselves, but the last ones have annoying gimmicks, like one that has a giant wall of fire that follows you, basically putting you on a timer, which as I've said before, doesn't work well in Patapon. The problem is while dungeons are interesting, you are forced to put up with two whole stages if you just wanted to replay a boss for fun. Not that you get to actually refight the first boss, instead you battle against an upgraded version with slightly different attacks and a different look, since you can't replay any story mission. A step down from the second game, especially with how much work it can take to reach the later parts of the story in this game. This seems to be an attempt to integrate the story into the gameplay further by making dead characters stay dead even in replays. But I would have much preferred for them to simply let us replay parts of the story, leveling up the enemies if needed. That said, while I vouch for making all the stages and bosses replayable, there's no boss in the campaign I wanted to fight fairly. Dying and being forced to redo the entire dungeon is tiring, so I'd rather not take chances. Especially because story bosses have an awful habit of raging when low on health. In this rage mode, the bosses attack more often and faster, almost constantly. This doesn't work in a game like Patapon, where you have to follow a rhythm. The only thing this caused was to make me spam all the sutras, to kill it before it killed my team, or to get a pill that would keep it stucker all the time, or one-shot it. Which is not as hard as it sounds. Compared to the stages, especially the ones in the dungeons, the storyline bosses are kind of frail so you'll get your team all built up for these hard stages, and when you reach the boss, it'll be over in the blink of an eye. The other option are rare super bosses. These have missions consisting of just their battle. They're challenging fun, but they're late game content and only appear when they feel like it. In fact, both dungeon bosses and super bosses can be found when you have a team that's not too weak or strong. But in the case of the former, it rarely was like that. Also. I find it sad that other than the final boss, and more or less the first, all dungeon bosses are taken from the previous games. The smaller foes are a mixed bag. The new enemy faction are a tribe of skeleton fashion warriors called the Bone Deaths. They feel like cannon fodder more than anything else. More than any other tribe in fact. They don't even get deck upon equivalents. Instead the real threat lays in the big creatures that you fight alongside them, like cyclops, dragons, golems and so much more. These guys start like mini bosses, but as you grow stronger, they act more like elite units to the point that they feel like the real enemies. In fact, the final stage doesn't even have a single bone death. Only these creatures. The monsters are entertaining, don't get me wrong, they're varying in design and attacks, although they get very annoying when they advance and push you backwards. In some circumstances during dungeons, they even put you against a wall, making it impossible to dodge them. 
that my biggest gripe with them is that they outside the regular soldiers. The bone death should have been more imposing by themselves, and the monsters should have been something more special, something more rare or less frequent. There's also the dark heroes, seven bosses that work like your hero, with their own class and special attacks. They appear more frequently as you advance the story. They're not that strong by themselves, but their special skills can shake things up a bit, and when they begin teaming up, well, they can become pretty dangerous. But they are not as amazing gameplay-wise as they are story-wise. More on that later. So, in conclusion, while personally I would have done things differently with the enemies, I think they mostly range from okay to good, unlike the bosses. The problem is when you mix them with the other details, like the dungeons, the over-reliance on fire, the grass everywhere, the huge stats, the grinding, and Hadapon. Even if the bone deaths were the main threat of the game, and had all the Padapon 2 classes available in their forces, it wouldn't make fighting them dozens of times to level up or getting burned by them constantly any more fun. Instead, the game often feels frustrating. I can't say anything about the multiplayer, but the single player story constantly got on my nerves, with the silver lining being that there are classes and builds to break it when you get annoyed at it. I often found myself using Kanoka Bang and Can Assault and just staggering enemies to death with them. But through this, at the core of it all is still Padapon, with its music-based gameplay, a beautiful art style, and a fantastic musical score. I can't stress how good the music is in this game. Most of the best songs in the franchise come from this game, if you ask me. There are many things that annoy me, but at times things click into place just right, it's a blast. It's just a shame that it doesn't happen more frequently. That said, let's move into the story and the characters, because there's a lot to say about them. Patapon 3 has the most developed story of the franchise, although it's still on the simpler side. The Patapons are still traveling, like they do in the other two games, but then they come across a giant box. They open the box and evil spirits fly out of it and turn the whole tribe into stone, save for Hadapon. Then an old Hossipon helps revive a few of them by infusing them with the spirits of all heroes. Among them is your hero from the second game, who gets fused with the great Patapon, or in other words, he gets fused with you. Now it's your duty to take down these spirits known as the Arc Fiends and all the forces they command. It's a good pitch, although you should see the trailers before playing the game. They explain things more explicitly, making for a less confusing introduction, because without it, I played it the first time without seeing the trailers and I was a bit confused during the beginning. You get used to it, but it's a bit of a not way to start without context. The beginning seems very reminiscent of the other two, however, with a patapons against ropes, getting reinvigorated by your return, or marching forward to strike back against adversity. Yet it feels bleaker. Patapon 1 and 2 has you start with very little, but the patapons grow as you get more units and minigames, and even after you complete your first actual mission, you get to see the Patapon celebrating, showing that things are looking good. In Patapon 3, with everyone turning to statues, you know this is all you'll have. Rather than a camp with funny characters and minigames, you get a small cave with barracks and a forge and practical military stuff. And Madden gets to be a statue. Which, after having her for two games talking to you between levels, it actually made me miss her. To cap it off, there's the music. Now rather than Joyce chanting, you have a serene theme that fits the lonely nights at the cave. This isn't exactly a bad thing. Clearly they wanted to make the game darker from the beginning and they passed with flying colors. That's the thing, Patapon 3 feels dark, cooler and a bit gloomier, although this mood wavers. The game has all this serious stuff, but other than the beginning and the end, there aren't many scenes that are purely serious. Between those bits, there is a lot more lighthearted stuff and a lot of comedy. In fact, this might be the game with the most comedy of the three. If it sounds like I'm calling it bad and inconsistent, that's not it. In my opinion, they did the right thing. If the whole game was like the beginning, it wouldn't have the same charm that makes Patapon what it is, because a fully serious Green Dark Patapon wouldn't work. The darker elements in the Patapon franchise work well because they're not the whole game. And I have to give props to the game for what it does right here. Despite how different it feels to the others, never did it feel like it wasn't Patapon. Like it could be anything but Patapon. Maybe that says more about me than it says about the game. I don't know. 
After this exciting beginning, the story becomes pretty formulaic, with the characters advancing to a new area, meeting a new dark hero, fighting said dark hero in a duel, and getting to a dungeon to defeat an arc fiend. Then repeat the same steps with a different arc fiend and more dark heroes, and so on. There's also other smaller plots going around, with a lot of emphasis on character development, and those are the ones that really shine. There's also more cinematic flair in this game. There are many cutscenes, and this time they don't focus always on the pentapons. A lot of cutscenes involve things happening away from your team now, breaking away from the Half-Life storytelling, where all you got was what your protagonist saw. It's interesting to think about it, but I'm perfectly fine with the change if it's a price for developing the characters. There is one complaint though, as it seems like the good guys comment a few times on things as if they somehow learn information from cutscenes they're not involved in, which makes no sense. So the characters here are the biggest cast of established characters in any Padapunk game. On your side, you have Silver Hossipon and the hero. The former gets fleshed out and serves as Madam's replacement, guiding the Padapons and advising you. He's fine. I miss Madam, but I like this old man's humor and the way he fits the story. The Andro Hero, now fused with the almighty Patapon and carrying the title of Uber Hero, gets the best deal of the good guys. He gets the most focus among them and serves as the protagonist. You get to make choices for him, but he often came to me as a sarcastic wise guy, regardless of the choices you make. His role is not too different from Patapon too, but he feels more personally involved, so I'd say as a protagonist he's improved. The rest aren't that much. There's four more Patapons, including Hanapon, but they feel relevant to the story for most of it. They serve more as a tool for comedy, and you could easily have Hanapon do what they do in most cutscenes without any difference. Not that I'd want to, instead, I would have preferred to see them more. They're never present in any scene outside the base camp, with one exception. I would have liked to see them supporting the hero, since they're teammates and all. I don't think they should've been in all cutscenes because they'd get very crowded, but at least have them interact with the dark hero sometimes. As it is in the final game, the hero comes more like a loner that is more friends with the bad guys than the good guys, which is just odd. Moving over to the villains, there are many of them. Seven arc fiends and seven dark heroes. The arc fiends have little to no personality or physical presence despite being so important. After turning most patapons to stone, something you don't get to see by the way, all their dirty work is done by the bone deaths, the monsters and the dark heroes. With the exception of one flashback, they only appear at the end of their respective dungeon to possess a boss taken from a previous game, a boss that's quickly dealt with. Villains without charisma are fine, but if the big villains are going to be like this, they need to make up for it with their actions, and the arc fiends don't get any points from that either. The leaders of the enemy tribes in Patapon 1 and 2 are each more developed and interesting than these seven guys combined. It's the dark heroes who are the highlight of the story. They're a colorful bunch with a lot of development by Patapon standards. They're presented progressively as you advance through the story, which helps build a certain intrigue. My first playthrough kept me interested in seeing what new character I would meet after beating a dungeon. They're all fun to watch, even the less fleshed out ones have an entertaining personality or at the least a gimmick that helps them stand out and bring something new to the scenes they participate in. My favorite ones are Rage Wolf and Notifins. They have the most interesting character development and backstory, and they're the most endearing of the bunch. One being the straight man of the group and the other being a huge pervert who acts as a perfect foil for Rage Wolf and often takes every chance to flirt with the hero. The others are fine, but some don't get that much to do before their character arc ends, and not one of the seven dark heroes has that great a conclusion. Their stories all get an ending, but left me wishing they had a better closure to their character arc, or that they had explored aspects of them that were implied, but not actually developed. The story is more of the same, the same exact problem, and it gives me conflicted feelings. It has good things, but it could've been extended further, and it leaves asking questions, not the kind that are better off as a mystery. But I don't want to talk about that yet, because it's obviously a big spoiler. So all in all, despite all the issues I mentioned and all the frustration it makes me feel, I would have a hard time calling Patapon 3 bad, or even saying I hate it. I could say it's a love-hate relationship. As much as it got on my nerves, as unfair and tedious it fell at times to play it by myself, the game kept me going at it until the end. There is a lot of good, 
The game seemed to have a dedicated player base. Even to this day, there are fans who remember the game fondly, and I can see why they enjoyed it so much. And from a technical point of view, the game works mostly flawless, like the previous games, with the exception of one single bug that happens randomly from time to time when you are preparing for a mission. Conveniently, you have the barracks where this never happens, and it makes me think this might be a reason why they added the barracks. The team behind the game tried something different, and it didn't quite work for me. And that's fine. As I said before, when everything clicked right, it was phenomenal. When Battlefront 3 is good, it's very good. The post-game content doesn't attract me much since it focuses on leveling up more and getting even stronger. But I had my surf entertainment while the story lasted, even with all the vile I spewed at the worst levels. Especially that one stage near the end with a poisonous monster that has an invincibility phase and melts your melee fighters without even attacking them. The people who played it know what I mean. Now, if for whatever reason you're watching this and you haven't played the games, I really believe you should give them a try. That includes Patapon 3. So here's some tips before I move on to the powerful spoilers. Choosing the seal for your hero is the safest option. It gives head up on a bigger chance of survival and gives access to Don Denga, who as far as I'm concerned is pretty broken. Bow and Spear let you get broken classes too, but later on. Kanoka Bang is especially dangerous. Can assault less so, but he can still cause a lot of trouble to your enemies if you get all his class skills. Once you unlock Alosan, level him up at least once to unlock the Tropical Tailwind skill. It's always good to have. By the time you reach the third dungeon, you should be more than able to complete at least one of the training missions fully. Do them to get extra keys. You don't want to reach the end of the sixth dungeon's second floor only to be forced to retreat and lose all your items like an idiot. It happened to me. And above all else, be patient. This is a game that takes time. As for getting the games, the first two games you can get the remastered version for console, but based on the research I've made, the PSP versions are the better choice. If you want to buy this game and you can afford a PSP, get the originals. And play with headphones. It sounds obvious, but it took me until the second game to try it. And believe me, when I did it, I felt I had become three times better instantly. And now, before I get more in depth about things, the big spoiler warning. From here on, I'm going to talk without repairs, so if you want to play the games for the first time, it's the best moment to stop watching the video. First off, the dark hero mode is a waste. You get an alternate mode as the bad guys, with all the dark heroes playable and their own base, and all you can do is play online versus battles. Would it be fun to play against bone death units and monsters in dungeons and other levels? Maybe even a short campaign too? Considering you have to go through the final dungeon of the game for this, it's a real lackluster reward. What makes it worse is the dark heroes themselves look interesting. They're interesting characters to play as from what I've seen. Though I wouldn't be surprised if they're just as grindy or more than the average class, since grinding is all there can be to this game mode. Also not related but Arc Fiend of Restraint Floor 2 and Covet His Love's Cannons are the best stages in the entire game. Now getting back on track. Let's talk about the story. My biggest issue with it is once you pass the evil mess of Adamans, it presses a nitro pedal with the characters. The Dark Ones and Black Hoshipon stop existing. In the second game, Black Hoshipon runs away after you take out Garudu, but by then you had killed multiple of his forces, including the Dark Hero who you fought several times in a row. Black Hoshipon's presence in Patabon 2 feels almost like an intermission from the rest of the story, but he has more screen time and I assume he was summoned by the Carmen for help, just the same way as the Tom Carmen is at the end. Patapon 3 has him come by his own volition, yet it adds nothing to the plot. Naughty Fins begins remembering things and she's strapped to this machine. Then after some time absent, she returns after the evil mass dungeon. All she does is either leave forever or return to her original form as the Patapon Princess. Either way, this is her last cutscene. In this scene, it doesn't seem like she was dragged or lobotomized, so the cutscene with Sonarchy saying, I'll take care of her, doesn't amount to anything. At best, it could be foreshadowing about him not lobotomizing Slug Turtle and Basgrave later on, but that feels like a big stretch for me to say it's dead. 
They could have had her deserting after her memories came back and it wouldn't have made a difference. What happens to her also makes no difference. Whether you save her or not, this is the last time you get anything from her in the story. She has no bearing in any stage or scene. Even the one right after doesn't acknowledge her in any capacity. The most you get is having her stand next to the hero gate like a mannequin. No dialogue other than apparently a line telling you to take care when you go to another player's lair. We don't get to see how she reacts to the ending, or any further insight into her character and her relationship with the hero as a princess. It's as if it doesn't matter what happens to her. Blade's Wolf has it better, but it feels like there was a lot more they could've done with him. They heavily imply he's Makaton, the same guy who's fought you from the first game for revenge. This guy hates Patapon so much that after losing his memories, he still hates them on first sight. In Patapon 2, Gong asks you to help him find peace, and the boy seems to feel regret at his actions in his last breath. This implies he died freed from his hatred and the control of the Dark Ones. A tragic and proper ending for his character. Having him return again seems strange and unfitting as much as I like the character. His relationship with Notifin shows his nicer side. He worries for the girl all the time, even calls you out if you don't save her. I like the irony of it, but feel like it should be explored further. Or actually explored. His allies turn on him and kill him when he recovers his memories, but he couldn't know what Notifin's true identity based only on his memories as Makaton, or Black Husband's dark hero either, and there's no scene in the game implying he knows it. I would have liked to see him face a conflict upon learning the friend he cares so much for is the leader of the tribe he hates so much, but we get nothing like that. His sudden death is fine, but he deserved more to his character development before it. Also, he doesn't exchange even one line with Black Hoshipon. A missed opportunity, if you ask me. Ravenous has it good. He is the only one with a flashback, and he gets a nice send-off with his final duel where he fights you riding a dragon. The battle itself is way too frustrating, and I don't like it. But from a story perspective, I think it's a really good finale. The problem is once you defeat him, and he comes back to his senses, he just leaves. Claims the Oberhero and him are meant to walk different paths in life, and depending on your dialogue choice, you might get the improved Ziggur tank sent by him to help in the next mission. The Ziggur tanks operating it seem confused, implying they expected him to fight alongside you. This gives me the impression that he left and didn't come back to his tribe. He's another character who I think deserved an epilogue scene. Something short to show if he actually came back with his tribe or actually went on his own only way. Did he turn back into Gong, or did he stay in that uber-hero form? I feel his resolution was too ambiguous for a character that was present in all three games. He deserved a bit more. And speaking of Gong, other than those two Zigatons who don't even have to appear in your playthrough, there is nobody of his tribe appearing. The Akuma Pons and the Queen Karma DLC boss battle don't count. One are their own faction, and the other is very unlikely to be canon. The Karmen have it even worse. They don't even appear in this game, at most they get one mention at the start of a level. But they're not even referred to by name. The Zygotons get to show their metal as allies a bit in two games, but Carmen get nothing but helping build a bridge. The rest of villains had a cool twist in paper. The reveal that the other four dark heroes and the bone deaths are the undead form of a tribe that Patapons wiped out a long time ago is a good piece of lore and could help make the Bone Deaths feel like more than random goons you steamroll during your missions. The games have never been shy about how neither side in the series had its hands clean. The Patapons too caused their serve disaster, both by accident and on purpose, but the Bone Deaths and their old Ah-U tribe don't get any focus on this. They could have had them try to get back at the Patapons for killing them, have them show a justified grudge against them, Sure, it would have been too much like the revived Zygotons in the second game, but they decided to give them that backstory, and it beats doing nothing with the revelation. When you find out about Orm and Carmen's involvement in the lore, you do it during a climatic duel in which you chase him through the Patapult Palace as he throws his spells at you. You see visions of the Patapons and the heroes past during the battle, all the while he taunts the hero for his failures. It feels like a proper way to end with the Carmen tribe. 
followed by a harder battle against the Tonkarmen. The Dark Heroes get just another versus match, with no interesting dialogue or scenes. The layout and the 10 minute timer don't help it stand out in any way. They shouldn't have stuck to the same level structure as the rest of the game, and have another story mission that's not an arena fight after this. Give us something more in the vein of Revenant's Duel of Fate that actually feels like a final battle. If there had been a better final fight between the remaining Dark Heroes and the Panapons, their ending would have been much more impactful. Focusing on the ending itself, them giving up and just looking to rest in peace again is an okay end, at least that's what I understood happens. After the way Covet has freed the others, it makes sense they'd revel. Sonarchy being forced to kill his father and king seems like a sad but fitting way to end things. Seeing how much tension was building up between the two of them, one was likely bound to kill the other. And I do like how Covet he seems to come to a realization just at the end, similar to Makaton. Though again, I would have liked to know more about the Ahu tribe. They're literally introduced in the end, and that's just sad. The way the game itself ends is a shame, too. The Uber hero is at the brink of death and is given three choices get revived to keep fighting, die to rest in peace, or sacrifice your soul to rescue his petrified tribe. I like this idea, but it comes out of nowhere. The last time you see the hero before this is while you kill the final boss, but then all of a sudden he's dying? It's like they skipped a cutscene, there's footage missing. How did the uber hero end up in this state, separated from the rest of his team? He's always been by himself in cutscenes outside the hideout, and this is the worst example of it. And what happens after? Because no matter what choice you make, it's almost the exact same thing. There's a different scene after the credits if you don't save the Patapons, but only if you have never saved them before. Once you save them, replaying the ending won't give you this scene even if you choose the other options. As for the hero himself, there's a different animation and a short comment from the mysterious voice. The hero deserved more. And better. He's the protagonist. We follow him through the whole story only for this small thing you could take away from the ending, and it wouldn't change anything. Only Jean acknowledges him. Metan almost does, but actually refers to you, rather than the uber hero that is fused with the Almighty. They could have made a short epilogue centered around him that changes depending on your choice. It didn't even need to be something big. Just a few seconds long like in Parapan 2. Maybe if you choose to live, we see him as a lone warrior that roams the lands only for battle, or if you choose to die, so the Patapons honoring his death, then you could have a variation of those scenes depending on if you save the princess or not, so you can also show her doing something, since she's his love interest and all. The rest of the ending is more complicated. I wasn't sure there'd be an earth end. Partially I thought the earth end of legend was a broken bridge at Patapole, and it was the locked princess, with Patapon 3 being simply about helping clean the world of darkness like the princess said at the end of the second game. And it seemed like that was what it was about, but then it turns out you do go to Earthen and find it. The end of the earth looks pretty, the foggy void with its own sky and light, the floating rocks and the stars give a sense of wonder. It's certainly the end of the world, but it's implying something more is out there. Perhaps once the Patapons have rebuilt their former glory, they'll head out to explore outside the world, onto a new realm. Yet once again, there's an asterisk here. As cool as it is to reach the end, and as pretty as everything looks when Silver Husband fixes it, the reveal is very unsatisfying. The camera just moves to the right slowly like someone uses a slide effect in a video editor. There's no music or sounds, no dialogue from the Patapons. In fact, they don't look like they care much for it. This is what they fought for in three games in a row. They were undirectly responsible for many souls getting soul in their search for this, and directly responsible for freeing a multiple all-powerful demons, and yet it's treated with the relevance of a pebble on the ground. But at least there's it at the end of the earth, and this one I don't have much against. Of course I'm bothered there's little to no reaction from the Patapons, though in this case it can be justified with them maybe not actually figuring it out. The idea that Silver Hossipon is it really works well in my opinion, even if it's not confirmed and only very heavily implied. But so is Rage Wolf as Makaton and it's pretty clear. Silver Hossipon, being the incarnation of hope, 
comes out of a box that contained malevolent spirits, a clear reference to the story of Pandora's box. He's the voice that speaks to you at the start of the game and most likely at the end too. He gives you power to face new challenges, helps revive a few of the parapons and guides them through what may be their lowest point, like a beacon of hope. Without them even knowing it, it is with them from the start. Also I like that he brings joy, being hope, and his bright light blinds the eye, just like the parapons come at the camp in the previous games. This is a good twist that does what a twist should, it gives new meaning to the story. Now there are some nitpicks, some more serious than others not really, like the rescued tribe always parting regardless of if you won or lost, or Medic not saying goodbye. But being serious, the story is a mixed bag, not so different from the gameplay. There is quite a bunch of things I'm not happy about, and it leaves me unsatisfied with many of the outcomes of the plot, but I can't deny there are portions I liked. I already explained I have a love-hate relationship with this game, and with the story, for the most part, my issue comes down to wanting more. I really feel there should be more. More scenes of characters, more of Earth and more of an epilogue. If I didn't like it, I don't think I'd want more, I'd just be glad it's done with. But this is it for the Parapons, it seems. For a game that was not made with sequels in mind, 3 games is a very good run. It's been over a decade already since Parapon 3, we've gotten 2 remasters over the following years, and the biggest thing I see happening anytime soon is another remaster for the final game. While I was replaying Parapon to refresh my memory and get footage for the review, Sony decided to dismantle Japan's studio, with some of its members moving to Team Asobi, and others going their way. This on itself is on the end of the world. Patapon 4 could be worked on by a different name studio and yet have most of the same people working on it. Although other than Rolito, I can't tell what happened with the other people, including Kotani himself. And this still doesn't spell the end of the franchise. A whole new team working alongside Rolito could still develop a fourth game and have something just as good come out that captures the same essence as the others. The property won't magically stop existing, and I doubt Sony would handle it to some other company. You don't give out your properties like they were candy. Rolito himself seems fine with a new game, but as he said himself on his Instagram, it's not up to him, it's up to the people who call the shots at Sony to decide, and I doubt they're that interested in making a new game. Games take money, and companies in general will care more about the big ones that make big bucks. There are many smaller franchises that have loved fan bases clamoring for a new game, but they get nothing because those games won't sell enough to be worth it in the eyes of the people in charge. Sure there were remasters, and those things do take work, but a fourth game is something else. The chances are low, although I won't pretend anything is written in stone. I've seen franchises that hadn't gotten a new game in years make a comeback multiple times. To me it's clear that a franchise never really dies, it just goes dormant, and if one day Patapon gets a new sequel, I'll be happy to try it. In the meantime, we have to wait. Maybe they'll get more cameos, or maybe Rolito will draw more art of them. There is a good amount of art he's made and posted after the release of Patapon 3. Even excluding unused concepts, promotional art and commemorative pictures, there are drawings of the Patapon tribe interacting with other characters and creatures. All wonderfully done Rolito's colorful art style. You should check out his art if you haven't. You might enjoy even his drawings that are in Patapon related. To me, these drawings of the Patapon tribe in places on now feel like little windows into stories we haven't seen. Patapon 3 didn't have a teaser at the end, there was no boat or bridge, all at this very ambiguous moment where the screen is black and you hear the sounds of chains and water splashing. To me this brings to mind a ship being dropped in the water. Could it be this foggy void was actually a river or an ocean? Maybe they did after all go past it into a new world full of wonder. And these illustrations are snippets of that world beyond. From the first to the last game, we came to help the Patapons in their moments of need and left them strong, victorious and ready to keep moving forward. So it could be they're still out there, further growing and exploring, and they just haven't needed our help since.